Again, good evening. Uh, we appreciate everybody's attendance here this evening, the opportunity to speak, uh, to do our part to lighten the load for Freddie's dad. And uh, again, very thankful for that opportunity. In terms of our topic this evening, <clears throat> belief, faith, grace, and works. And you're probably looking at that and saying, I hope he doesn't try to cover all of those topics tonight. We, won't, we will never leave. But we're going to be doing a very cursory 20,000 foot view from above kind of view of these topics. And I put here reaffirming fundamental concepts. I don't think there's anything here that is earth shattering things that you necessarily haven't heard before. But it's always important for us to reaffirm these things and make sure we understand them well and can explain them to others. Because the way these things work together in reality is something that is incredibly confused in the religious world today. Uh, it's something that's not very well understood. Uh, of course, we know biblical literacy is not where it should be in the world, but um, it's still something that we need to have a good grasp on and be able to understand well in order to talk to them about it. So why study these things? We just talked about what does most of the religious world, Christian world, I put in quotations, say about salvation, how you become. Well, if you've never seen the televangelists that say, well, just accept Jesus into your heart, right? Just Pray the sinner's prayer, accept him into your heart, um, and you're good to go. You know, no further action necessary. Continue, continue on your merry way. Go back to the way you were living. You're saved. Grace covered it. Good to go. And I think that's something we need to examine to see is, number one, that's something Jesus taught, his apostles. Did they teach that? Was that early church doctrine? Um, or was it something very different? And in a world that has so many beliefs, people professing different things, how can you really know for sure what somebody believes? They say they believe this, they say they're a Christian, they say they love Jesus, how can you know? And then I think on the other side, when we get to the work side, we also need to be careful that we maybe don't get trapped in this mentality of thinking, well, I just need to do more good works to be saved. And I put more with a little asterisk there. Because I think the Bible absolutely teaches us to grow and to do more and more and more, but not so that we can earn our salvation or merit it by something that we might deserve. So I like to start out by defining terms so that when I say something, um, you understand kind of what I mean by it, and so we're not misunderstanding one another. So when I say words like merit, all right, I'm talking about some type of deserved compensation, like a wage, like a salary. Say you were to contract somebody to come out and dig you a ditch, and you agree you're going to pay them two, three hundred dollars. This is a short ditch, right? Once they complete the ditch, they deserve that compensation for the work that they did, right? They deserve it. They've earned it. It's a wage. It's a salary. That's what I mean by merit. They deserve that. Well, what do I mean when I say grace? A lot of think, people think, well, that's the G, so we can remember gift, right? And that's, that's basically right. It's some type of unmerited favor. It's undeserved, right? So if the person digs your $200, $300 ditch and you pay them the $200 and then you say, you know what? I'm going to pay you an extra $3 million on top of that. The $3 million is not merited, right? It wasn't part of the contract. It's way, way above and beyond what the contracted price was for that. Grace is a gift. It's unmerited. What about belief? So I'm going to say a belief is an assertion that something is true. That doesn't mean it's necessarily true, but it's an assertion by the mind that something is true. You can certainly believe things that are false, and we see that throughout our world in reality. What about faith? Now, in the Bible, we see faith oftentimes used almost synonymously with belief, but it's stronger, okay? It's a strong belief that we will always see provoke some type of action. And if you look at Hebrews 11, when it's talking, you might say, the biblical definition of faith, it talks about it being the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So if you think about that word assurance, you can even see our word sure inside that word assurance. If you ask somebody, are you sure? Are you positive? Are you 100% on something? Are you convicted? If you look at the word conviction, someone who has convictions, what does that mean? Does that mean they're easily swayed on a political or spiritual or moral belief? No, that means they're set in their ways, right? They are convicted about a topic because they believe it very, very strongly. And they will act on that. And then what do I talk about when I say works? Works are just any action or deed. It could be spoken when you talk to one another in spiritual hymns, 
when we encourage one another, that could be included under these works. They're actions and deeds, but they're always provoked by a belief whether you realize it or not. Okay, so just very quickly, and, and you may disagree with a couple of these, but when I say these words, this is what I mean, okay? So let's start first talking a little bit about grace. So we've already kind of established that grace is this unmerited favor. It's undeserved. And this is important to understand because a lot of the world will say, well, we can be saved on grace alone. Just accept him into your heart, say the prayer, mentally uh, assent to the existence of Jesus or God, and you're good to go. But does the Bible teach that we are saved on grace alone? Let's start with Romans 6. Most of the verses will be up here so we can move fairly quickly. But Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages. We just saw wages under the definition of merit. Did we not? The wages of sin is death. So what do we deserve based on the work that we've done here on earth? The sinful works that we've done. We deserve death. So grace is a free gift of eternal life. Is it with or without conditions? I appreciate Tracy reading from Ephesians 2. We're going to look there at the very end, verses 8 and 10 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a lot concentrated here in these few verses that I want to unpack a little bit. First of all, it is grace. We need grace. But we're saved through this faith. So we're going to look at faith here in a minute. And it's not a result of just doing good works. Okay? So we can't stand before God and boast and say, look at me, Lord. I did enough good works to outweigh the sin. We've already established the sin, the payment, the wages, the merit for that is death. Okay? We can't do enough good works to equalize what Jesus paid with his blood. You can't do it. You can be a great person. And you can think about it in this way. If you, were, if you lived by the world standard, an amazing life, good life, charitable life, and then maybe in your older age, you murdered somebody, right? And you go before the judge and the jury, and you're like, well, look at all the good things that I did throughout my life. Are they going to care about that? No. You murdered somebody. You're guilty before the law. We need to think about that as well when it comes to our sin. We need this grace. And then here it says, but at the end, we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. This is not a contradiction for which God prepared beforehand. This is something they had planned from the beginning that we should walk in them. Walk in them is not something that is just, it's not casual. It's not something that you just dabble here and there. It's a way of life. You're walking in them. So we see that we were even created for good works, but again, these good works are not to merit salvation. Let's keep going. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So if we're talking about the idea of grace... That grace, that free gift of God of eternal life is needed. We cannot merit it by just doing enough good works. And I want to establish that. The world is correct when they say grace is needed. But saying grace is needed is the only thing needed and you don't need to do anything else is not at all what we're going to see biblically. So let's look into this idea of belief and faith. John 6, verses 27 through 29 says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And I don't believe this belief in him whom God has sent is simply a mental assent to his existence. Of course, they believed in Jesus as a person. They were witnessing him. What does it mean to really believe God? A lot of people say, well, I believe in God. But do you believe God? Do you believe what he says? If you believe Jesus, what does that entail? It entails more than just, oh, I believe he exists. If you truly believe him, you believe what he says, and you will do what he asks. If you'll turn with me over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Starting in about verse 
14. James 2, starting in verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things that is needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, and in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And here, I'll admit, In James 2, faith is being used almost synonymously with belief. But the point is, everybody who believes something truly will act on it. Um, You can't say, oh, yeah, I hope hope you're doing okay. I hope you're warm and filled, but you don't give them the things you need. We we know that is hypocrisy. And this is not a concept um, that is foreign to us in the way that we live our daily lives. In fact, we demonstrate faith in almost every aspect of our life every single day. The school bus. So school is getting back into session. Barrett is about, our oldest is about to start kindergarten here on Wednesday. He's very excited, a little bit nervous. But uh, he is very excited about this school bus. And the school bus, we we live out in the country, we have a very long driveway, and if you don't get up and you get ready, get your book bag, get showered, get out to the road half mile away and get there on time, it doesn't matter if you believe in the school bus. You won't go to school on the school bus. Right? We understand that. We don't even think about it. But we believe in the school bus, even though we've never seen it on our road. We assume that it will be there at some point, and we will put actions behind that belief, and that's faith. Right? We think about it. What about the garbage truck? Anybody ever have garbage? Right? We don't see the garbage truck either because it's really far away. You probably see it run back and forth in front of your house. But if your garbage is not at the road on Thursday or Tuesday at 10 a.m. or whenever they pick up, your garbage is not getting picked up. Right? I don't see the garbage truck. I put it out there, the garbage disappears. But I have faith it's there, so much faith, that I take it to the road. Appointments. We do, you have an appointment for the dentist, a doctor's appointment, what have you. The first time you go to this appointment, you've never been to the office, you don't know the doctor. It's not a blind faith. You may have received a referral. You've heard from other people it's a good dentist or a good doctor. It's not blind But you do multiple things to get ready for this appointment. You call them, you talk to them, you plan a date, you plan a time. You maybe get people to take care of your kids. You travel to the location. You do all of this so that the appointment goes as planned. What about work? Anybody work in here? How does that work? If you work a salary job, maybe you get paid once a week, maybe once every two weeks. When I lived in South America, we got paid once a month, and it was at the end of the month. So you worked the entire month and got one lump sum at the, at the end of the month, not at the beginning, right? So you had, you had to budget pretty well, and you had to have a lot of faith that all the work and belief that you were demonstrating to your employer during that time was going to be rewarded with compensation at the end. That's faith. Airplanes. Anybody believe an airplane can fly? I do. But it doesn't really matter if you believe it can fly if you don't buy the tickets, Get to the airport, go through TSA security, walk to your gate, wait an eternity, get in line and get on the plane. It doesn't matter because if you don't put actions behind your belief, everything else is null and you will not ride on the plane. We understand this. We understand when people truly believe something, they will put action behind that. That's faith. And we demonstrate it in all aspects of our lives. So why is it different with God? It shouldn't be, right? It's so common, in fact, that we recognize hypocrisy in the lives of people who don't act this way. We'll say they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They say they believe this, but they don't act that way. We understand actions 
speak louder than just words. We understand that there can be a conflict between those two things, and whatever's true will be reflected in the person's actions. There's examples of faith, millions of them it seems in the Bible. Walls of Jericho, the walls of Jericho were massive. You could drive chariots on top of them side by side. Can you imagine how much faith it would have to, you would have to have to go around that thing every single day? You don't get immediate results. It's going on for a week. But what about Noah? I don't know if any of you have ever been up to Kentucky, to that creation museum and the, the ark. The thing is huge. Was it like a football field and a half? Three floors. They tried to make it as accurate as they could. It is monstrous. And to think about Noah being instructed, how much belief would he have to have to then put in action him working with his sons, his sons' wives, I assume they helped, and they're constructing this over a massive amount of time. It's not transactional. It's an investment of lifetime that they're putting into building this thing when they maybe have never seen, well, they've definitely never seen a flood of that cataclysmic nature. What about Abraham? We read about him a little bit there in James about him offering his son Isaac, and we read in other places that, you know, he believed even if God had let him go through with the sacrifice of his son Isaac, that he had the power to, to resurrect him. But think about Abraham even before then, when God comes to him, and, you know, Abraham's wealthy. He's living in Earl of the Chaldees, Bab Babylon, we would say, that area. Uh, archaeologically, it was quite advanced from what we know, and being told, you know, leave, and I'm going to show you where you're going to go. Okay, and he just does it. He didn't say, well, you know, I believe you exist, God, but it's pretty nice here in Earl of the Chaldees. You know, I'm pretty wealthy. I've done pretty well for myself. No, he goes and he follows and he has faith. He has a belief and he puts action behind it. You think about Peter stepping out of the boat. And a lot of people, well, you know, later he faltered and lost, lost his attention towards Jesus. But he had faith to begin with. He said, if it's you, Lord, you call me out and I'll come to you. And he says, come. And he steps out on those waters and walks on water. What about Naaman? We talked about this on Wednesday night in the invitation. You know, Naaman didn't set out um, from Syria, Damascus, with little hope. Think about all the talents, silver he had. He had shekels worth of gold. He had all kinds of changes of clothing. He wasn't going with the concept of, oh, this is not going to be successful. In fact, he had preconceived notions of how the healing was going to be and how he was going to come out and wave his hand around the place. Of course, we understand he had an attitude problem with how it was gonna how it was gonna happen. You know, why can't we go use these other nicer rivers? Why does it have to be the dirty Jordan? And I think people in the religious world today, they get they have attitude problems about the methods. You know? But if Jesus asked us, it's like it's like his servant says there, if you had been asked for to do some great thing, you know, climb a mountain, pluck the tail feather from an eagle at the top of this peak, would you not have done it? I mean if salvation required us to climb Mount Everest, I'd be training to climb Mount Everest, right? Luckily, it's not that case. But it was something simple, yet he still had an issue. But ultimately, he put action behind his belief and was healed. What about Saul? Paul, I know a lot of people in the religious world, and I've heard them personally say this to me, that they believe Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. I mean, he saw Jesus personally, right? Jesus told him about his plans for him in the future. Do you think Saul believed in God before, before then? Of course he did. He was incredibly religious. He was persecuting people according to that way. He thought, and later on he'll say he lived in all good conscience. He thought what he was doing was the will of God until he found out otherwise. And then, of course, he's taken in and he's praying for, and not eating or drinking for three days before Ananias comes and says, rise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How can you be saved if your sins are still? These are people who had faith. They had beliefs. But ultimately, they put actions behind them and didn't just mentally ascend. It wasn't just something that they professed, like a lot of people in this world do today. So let's look a little bit about, about words, works, excuse me. In 1 John 5, verses 1 through 3, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. We understand this too in our daily lives, even though maybe many won't admit it. You know, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We demonstrate this all the time. If you love somebody, if you're married, even if you're not married and you have a close relationship with someone, how do you show love for them? If they ask you to do something, you do it. Like if I told Scarlett, you know, I love you, but she asked me to do something and I don't do it, 
guess what? It's like what we've been talking about. We put words out there, but our actions aren't backing them up, and it's false. That, that's a faith that, that is untrue. It's, it's useless. But if we say we love them, and we do what they say, and what they ask us to do, that's the same thing Jesus is saying here. People are like, what do you mean? A lot of people will say, do you, you, know, do you, do you know who Jesus is? Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you love him? Oh, yes, I love him. Do you do what he says? Oh, no. What do you mean? It's like there's an inconsistency that people don't see when it comes to spiritual doctrine, but we can see it easily in our everyday life. Titus 3.8, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. I want to focus in here on the idea of devotion, this word devote. What do you think of when you think of this word devotion? Have you ever heard somebody say, I don't know, I'm a casual learner of whatever, hobby, Spanish, chess, whatever you're, fill in your hobby. I'm a casual learner. What does that mean if they're a casual learner? It means they're not too serious about it. They dabble here and there. They spend some time at it, but they're not really serious about it. What if you were to say, I devote myself to chess? What does that mean? You study it day and night. You play it nonstop. You study, you watch videos. You are completely and utterly focused on that. You think in the Old Testament when God told people to, his people to go and devote cities to destruction. What did that mean? Go wage a battle against them? They killed everything. Men, women, children, animals. They burned everything. They, they tore down walls. It was total and utter completeness. So if we are to devote ourselves to good works, what does that mean? Does that mean that's just something we, we do occasionally, we dabble in? Or is it something that we have a total and utter focus on in our lives? And again, we're going to come back to it. This is not to earn salvation. This is not to merit salvation. But this is absolutely what we were created for and what we should be occupying ourselves with after we've come to Christ. John 15, 8. What is the motivation behind this if it's not to merit salvation? By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples, Jesus says. So two things here. One, it's to glorify God. And two, it's like we've been talking about. It's to prove that you really are his disciple. You can say you're his, his disciple, but if you don't do what he says, if you don't bear much fruit, you don't prove it. But it is to glorify him. And then we're going to look also in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 11 and 12. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every good work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the motivation behind this is not for us to be glorified. It's not to stack up enough good deeds so that we can stand before God justified. We can't justify ourselves by our own good works. That's the grace that he gives us. But it is ultimately for his glorification. And ultimately it says we will be glorified, of course, when he recognizes us on the day of judgment. So finally, I'm going to use this check example. And if you've ever talked to me about grace and faith and works, you will have heard this, this check example. But I like it because it's an analogy that works, I think, very well, and it's quite accurate. Imagine you are just drowning in debt, millions of dollars of debt. You could never pay it off. You, you put the quantity of money in there that you couldn't get out of if you worked for the rest of your life in another lifetime. You're, you're dying in it, and you can't get help. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up, and they have an out for you. They will pay off your debt and they will give you so much riches beyond that that you can just give it away for the rest of your life. But there are conditions. You must, first of all, um, pay off your debt and then you have to give to the needy for the rest of your life. You have to dedicate yourself to the service of others. And I've just, I've just thrown this up there. I picked an amount. It happened to be the, I think the US debt at some point last week. It was going up like $100,000 a second, so I just I had to take a snapshot. It was bad. Um, $35 trillion. It's a lot of money. But with that amount of money, you can pay off your debt, and then you can do philanthropic work the rest of your life, giving to the needy, giving to the poor. Now, there are certain things, though, that you have to do to access these funds. All right, well, first of all, you have to believe in the person who's giving the check, right? You have to believe the check isn't fraudulent, Right? This is a very fraudulent check, as you could tell. But you have to believe that it wasn't fraudulent, that the person actually has those funds in their account. 
right? And you have to accept the check physically, right? You, you could say thank you, and if you take that check home and throw it on your desk and do nothing, what good has, the, has it done for you? Nothing. A lot of people do that. They're like, well, I believe in the check giver. You know, I believe the funds are there, but I'm just going to kind of set that check over there. It does you no good. But if you take it, there's still more things you must do. You must endorse the back of this check. You must take it to the bank. You must fill out a deposit slip, and you must deposit it. And if you do all those things, have you earned $35 trillion by merit? No, it was still grace. It was still a free gift given to you. Now let's say you use the rest of your life, you've paid off your debt, and you start helping other people who are in the same situation you were in, trapped in sin, trapped in debt. They can't get out. Now if you did that for the rest of your life, could you stand at the end of your life and say, you know what? I really earned those $35 trillion that I gave away. No, it was still a gift. When you were going out and helping people, did you say, oh yeah, this is my money I'm giving you? No, you were pointing back to the person who gave it to you. And, and the glory goes to that person. Does it not? Do we see how that works? You, you do good works to glorify the person who helped you. Not because you can earn the $35 trillion with enough good works. That doesn't even make sense. But we do it out of thankfulness and gratitude for what we have been forgiven. If you'll think back to the, the parable of the talents. You know, you had the, the guy that got one talent. I think one had two and one had five. If you focus in on the two that were successful... They went out and they doubled the amount of talents. The talent was a massive amount of money. It wasn't just like a coin that some people think about. It was a massive amount of money that they went out and doubled. At the end of the, when they've doubled it and they come back to the master and are giving account, do they stand there and say, oh yes, I was worthy of the original two talents or five talents or whatever that you gave me. No, they were just good stewards. Are we good stewards with the gospel? Do we believe and put actions behind our faith? In conclusion, do you believe God? I didn't say, do you believe in God? Do you believe God? Do you believe what he says? Do you understand what belief entails if it's true, right? Do you have that true faith? We've looked at what true faith looks like. It always, always is accompanied by action, even in our daily lives. If you believe something, you put actions behind it, that's faith. And then ultimately, are you willing to prove that through the way that you live, through your works? Not in a, in a way to merit that grace. You can't do enough to outweigh what you've done or to equal the blood of Christ. It's impossible, but you're doing it out of thanksgiving and ultimately to the glory of the one who has done it for us. If you haven't gained access to that grace, if you're not part of his family, you need to be. Just saying that you believe in God isn't enough. Just saying I've accepted him into my heart, that's not biblical. Are you going to put actions behind your belief? Are you going to show true faith? Or are you going to just kind of live in this hypocritical, hypocritical mindset of, oh yeah, I can say one thing and have my actions do something else? It's not, going to, it's not going to work, unfortunately. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've become a Christian, but you're still living like that. You profess to be a Christian, but your actions don't always focus. Or you're not devoting yourself to good works as we should. Whatever your need may be, if we can help you, if we can pray for you in any way, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.